Now, as you can see, this is weird and awkward, so we want a better way to write this, right? Every new form of notation you ever learned was just because we were trying to solve a problem of something which was awkward and weird to write. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to try and stop writing negative numbers under square roots because it gives me the heebie-jeebies. We're going to introduce what we call an imaginary unit. The most basic negative number that you can take a square root of is negative 1. We call this the imaginary unit. Every other imaginary number is made up of these guys, right? For example, to get square root of negative 3, you multiply this by the square root of... Three. Do you agree? If I did this, I'd get that. And in order to stop doing this, because you're going to write this a heck of a lot, right? We give this a name, we call it I for imaginary. Okay? So I could rewrite my solutions here, if you like, as not minus one plus or minus this guy, but instead minus one, there's the real part, plus or minus some number of these, and I said before it was root 3 of them. There's the real part, there's the imaginary part. You put them together, you get a complex number. Make sense? Okay. Now we have just enough time to explore just a teeny bit of how these numbers play, um, how they're a little bit different to your normal numbers, and then you guys are going to do some work all the way up until Friday. Okay? So make a little subheading which is arithmetic. This. Okay, so um, a few basic facts. First, now that we've established the existence of this i thing, the square root of negative 1, we want to just establish what this thing can do, right? So if that's what i is, then if, for example, and I'm going to write all this up the top again just so I have it in a neater spot, if I were to say multiply i by itself, then by definition, i squared should give you negative one. negative 1. So in the past we would have said, there's no number that you can square to get a negative number. But that's because we didn't have the complete picture yet. We do now, more than you even realize. This is the complete picture. Um, what happens if I do it again? If I multiply by i another time? Negative one. Well, yeah, it's minus 1. Right, that's, that's i squared times i again. So that's negative i, is that, that okay? Right. I'm just gonna do this one more time. If I multiply by i a fourth time, you're taking this and multiplying by i. So this is i cubed times i. We just established that that's minus i times i. So what does this become? One. Yeah, it's, it's one because you've got a negative one here and then these guys become negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 1, 1. Hmm. Weird, that. Contemplate this for a little while. We'll return to this idea of cycling through i on Friday morning. But then you just need to know what the rest of the operations are, right? Uh, we've done this sort of cycling through. What about addition? Well, thankfully, if you were to add two complex numbers, and we can prove this if you like, if I've got a, a, a complex number z, by the way, z is our, our customary way of defining that we're talking about a complex number and not just a real number, I'm putting a dash through it because if you write a z fast and you write it a lot, it looks a heck of a lot like a 2, so bad idea, dash through it means a z. If I were to add a number which has a real component and an imaginary component with some other number, that had its own real component and its own imaginary component, what happens? You don't need to write this part, but if I gave you something like this, which you're pretty comfortable with, what happens when you add x and y in this case? Any takers in more than a murmur? What, what do we do with the one and the two? You add them, right? So the rational parts, they just go together. What about the other bits? They also add, right? These irrational parts, I can't quite mix them together with these guys, right? But that's okay, I sort of just keep them separate and they do their own thing, right? It's the same deal with these guys, right? We're gonna add these real components and then we're gonna add the imaginary components. So what do we get? Well, in this case, z 
plus W, you're gonna get these real bits out the front, and then you're gonna get these imaginary bits out the back. I'm gonna factor out the imaginary unit because that's kind of why we use it. This makes sense? So if I, if I swapped out all these root threes for i's, it would look exactly the same. One plus i, two plus four i, you would add them and get three plus five i, okay? I hope you can prove for yourself um, that subtraction will be the same. You've actually already done some multiplication. There's just one last piece of arithmetic that you need, which is a little trickier than all the rest. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Hmm. We'll go with this example. What if I told you to divide, uh, what did I give you? This. These guys together. What do I do with this? Now, if your emotional response was, yeah, I'll just, oh. <laughs> that's, that's how I felt the first time I met these, right? I was like, I, I'm a good mathematician. I can do dividing numbers. We actually need a tool from back over here to help us, right? If I asked you to divide these two, you'd run into the same problem because this irrational stuff makes things messy. Do you agree? It's, it's gross, right? Like, what do I deal with this? You've got the same problem here. If you're trying to get rid of irrational stuff, what do we call that? Particularly when it's on like a denominator. What do you call it when you get rid of the irrational stuff? Rational. We call it rationalizing denominators. And we, rational, we learn this skill in year nine so that we can handle stuff like this. Well, we're not rationalizing here. We're trying to make so something not imaginary. We're trying to make it real. So instead of calling it rationalizing, we're going to call it realizing. Now, the same trick that we use with rationalizing will work with realizing. Did you notice when we did this guy here, alpha, beta, right? You put two complex numbers together, but suddenly, in the end, oh, it's rubbed off. You ended up with a completely real number. Did you see that? Right, it ended up with four. What do I multiply the top and the bottom by that will realize this denominator for me? What do we call it? It starts with a C. Conjugate. The conjugate, right? It's two, two, minus four i, and two minus four i. We're not actually changing the fraction. Do you agree? So let's go ahead and we'll just quickly work out what this lands on. I'll work out the numerator in a minute. Let's just think about the denominator. A plus B. A minus B. Think for a moment. What's A squared? Four. It's four. I'm going to take away B squared, but what is B squared? It's four I squared, right? What happens to the four when I square it? Square. 16. What happens to the I when I square it? Negative one. Negative one. Minus 16. You with me? Minus, 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 minus. Got it. So you see difference of squares, right? A squared minus B squared is what you get when you're in real numbers. But actually, with complex numbers, you actually get a sum of squares. That's a bit weird, isn't it? I think you guys can handle the rest in the numerator like we did here.